Send my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! He's great now. He is so great. Then think my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Hallelujah. How great God is. We serve a great God this morning. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about what God is doing in the life of the believer. And as Deacon Bedford was singing that, Trustee Donnett, my mind went back to Jackson, Alabama, Mount Olive Baptist Church, when I was a young man, still in elementary school, when I first heard that song. But it was years later before I fully understood. We serve a great God this morning. How great is our God. We serve a great God. I think we can do the benediction right there. We serve a great God this morning. We want to say good morning again and welcome to the New Union Baptist Church. We thank God for our ushers, our musicians, our soloists, our media, all of you that are in, in attendance this morning. We stopped by this morning to hear that we serve a great and mighty God. This morning, our scripture lesson comes from the book of Jeremiah, amen. Jeremiah chapter number 31. We serve a great God this morning. This morning, I want to thank God for those who are at the church. Praise God for that. And after Sunday, we applaud what God here at the New Union Church. And welcome those who are online this morning. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse number 34. The Bible says, And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall know me from the least of them Unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Eternal God of Father, we embrace your presence yet again. We thank you, Lord God, for who you are. We thank you for being the great God in whom we serve, the great God who saved us, Lord God, the great God who has put us on a course, Lord God, that we might live for you, that we might glorify thy name. We pray, Father, we block our situation, circumstances, anything that will hinder our hearing, and cast it away. For it's in your name, Christ Jesus, we do humble. Jeremiah 31, 34 says, And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them saith the Lord. He says, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Just for a few moments this morning, from the least unto the greatest. Have anybody ever belittled you? Have anybody ever said that you'll never be this, that, or the other? But I stopped by this morning to say whether we are great or small, short or tall, the Bible says from the least unto the greatest. In other words, God sees us different than we see one another. 
I know Deacon is McAllister. I'm the only one in here that has ever picked on somebody. Uh, I know I'm the only one here, Sister Beverly, that has called somebody out their name. Sister Carla, I know I'm the only one in here that has thought some foolishness concerning somebody else. But God is telling us that irregardless of who you are or who I am, he says from the least unto the greatest. In other words, God is no respecter of person. Uh, just because we might put somebody down or somebody might put us down, God sees us differently. But Jeremiah, the son of Hekiah, in chapter 1, it says that he was pondering, he was contemplating about his role as a servant of God. He, he had no good news that he wanted to present because the people, you know, that the Bible says that, 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 that Jeremiah, he wanted to sit down because the people were not hearing him. But see, I stopped by this morning to say that that God told Jeremiah, he said, before you were even born, I had a job for you to do. But I love what we find in chapter 1, verse 7, when, when God was encouraging Jeremiah. He, he said, don't be afraid of their faces. Uh, I know it's, it's hard to, to stand before people because, because people, they, 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 they thinking about this or that about you. Jeremiah, he did not want to go and proclaim the word of God because the people were not, well, they were not paying him any attention. So by the time we get down to chapter 31, we find that, 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 that Jeremiah, he, he took his assignment. He, he says that the word of God was like fire, shut up in his bones. I don't know about you, but there was a time when we all said that we weren't going to tell anybody anything. But we came to the point to where we, we found that we couldn't keep it to ourselves. I said I was not going to tell anybody, but I couldn't keep it to myself. How great God is and how God has called you and I. Whether we're here again, whether we're the least or the greatest, God still has something in store for you and for me. But... The book of Jeremiah is viewed by some scholars as complex, conveniently divided into a biographical prose, a prophetic strands, each summarizing themselves separately. See, some scholars had a different opinion concerning the structure and the historical aspects of Jeremiah's writing. But see, Jeremiah's purpose is to explain the disaster as God's response to Israel's pagan worship. In Sunday school this morning, we were talking about we need to keep hope alive. See, the problem is, is that there's a lot of things that are going on around us. There's a lot of things that are going on in the government. There's a lot of things going on in our schools. There's a lot of things going on in our jobs. There's a lot going on. And, and, and Jeremiah, he was writing to let Israel know that the farther we get away from God, the more harsh things are going to seem to be. In other words, when we, when, when we walk away from God, we're setting ourselves up for the world to take charge. Have you noticed the things that are going on around us? Even though the killing in Texas, the killing over there in, 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 in Maryland the other day, um, um, Annapolis. What I'm trying to say is that stuff is going on all over. Jeremiah desires that you and I in a time of trouble. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, it is. The Bible is teaching you and I, not Nehemiah, but Nahum. Ne Nahum is the one that said that, that God, you know, he has his, his way even in the whirlwind. But what I'm trying to say is the people, just like us, are sometimes unfaithful. Sometimes we're rebellious, and sometimes we're stuck on ourselves. When I was growing up, that was a commercial. I'm stuck on Band-Aid, and Band-Aid is stuck on me. 
What I'm trying to say is, is that the by that 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 sometimes we are stuck on something, or something has stuck to us, and we cannot what we cannot move. But what I'm trying to say is, is that God has called you and I out of darkness and have placed us too into rather His marvelous light, that we would not allow the trials and the tribulations of life keep us back. Have you ever been rebellious? I know many of us was ready to get away from home because we was tired of doing what mom and dad said for us to do. But don't you know that God is our parent? He, he is our heavenly father. And, and, and I tell the young people often that, that if we listen to our parents, if you listen to your parents, there's a good chance that you may listen to God. Because God has given us our parents to practice with. Yes, he has. And, and so, 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 so my point being is that, that, that when we listen to our elders, there's a good chance that we might listen to God. See, 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 see I know when I was getting older, uh, Deaconess McCallum, when I, when I was getting older, Trustee Gibson, when I, when I was getting older, Sister Samson, when, when, I, was, when I was getting older, I thought, that I knew something. It's just like the youth of the day. They think that our grandparents don't know anything. They think that our grandparents, you know, you know, haven't been anywhere. But see, our grandparents were trying to teach us that we might be prepared when we go out into the world. And Jeremiah wants us to know and understand from the least unto the greatest, God is working in our lives. But see, the Bible teaches you and I that even though that we were sometimes rebellious, sometimes we were unfaithful, but restoration, the new covenant in which God had given Jeremiah that, that, the, that the children of Israel might come to know and understand that God is still working in the lives of his people. Do you see God working in your life? God is working in our lives whether we believe it or not, whether we understand it or not, whether we know it or not, God is at work in our lives. God is working through people. He's working through circumstances. He's working through situations. But, be, but make no mistake about it. He's working through his word. In this prophecy, Jeremiah, he agonizes over what he thought to be a failure. He thought that his mission, the things in which God had called him to do, he thought that it was, it was not coming up, you know, it, it was not coming into fruition. Don't look at your life as worthless. Because if we're doing things God's way, according to his will, according to his word, it's going to come out the way God says it's going to come out. We ought not get bitter about the things that are going on around us. Don't you know that some folk don't love the gift in which God has given you? See, that was Jeremiah's prophecy. See, see, God had, had gifted him and he thought that he was making no difference in the lives of the people. See, I stopped by to say, irregardless of who we think we might be, whether we're on top or whether we're on, on the bottom, God still has a work, and God is still fulfilling his promises in our lives, and all we have to do is continue to do what God has called us to do. See, Jeremiah, he had got bitter concerning the things of God. You may have gotten bitter sometimes with the things in which you're doing, but, but don't you know that people are going to come up against you because you're doing God's will? See, I, I, I really don't understand this, Sister Williams, but, 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 but the gift that God has given you and I, don't you know that some folk envy the gift? Instead of celebrating what God is doing in the life of somebody else, we ought to be celebrating what God is doing in the body of Christ, whether it's the least or the greatest. But see, the Bible always talks about putting ourselves last. So we ought to be the least. I, I ought to be the least up in here in New Union. I'm not the greatest. 
Jesus is the greatest. We just heard how great he is. But see, Jeremiah, he was agonized. He, he was being distressed because he didn't think that he was making a difference. And God wants you and I to know, irregardless of what somebody think or how they feel about us, God is still at work in our lives. But we are not to allow people to get us off course because the situations and the things that are going on in this world, they are beating people down. Well, yeah, yes, they are. Because we're focusing on the wrong things. We're focusing on the wrong person. You know, we, 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 we know that God is going to get us through any and every situation. We're praying for Sister Carla. We know that God is going to get her through that surgery on tomorrow. But as we continue on this road called life, we, like Jeremiah's audience, we need God's forgiveness in our lives. It's interesting. It's not interesting. The song that we had this morning, by standing in need of prayer, is not my brother or my sister, my father or my mother, the stranger or the neighbor. It's me, oh Lord, that's standing in the need of prayer. See, all of us have put somebody down. Yes, we have, if we be true to ourselves. And we need to, you know, to look at people the way God sees people. We don't put people in a category. Because the Bible is teaching you and I that, that, that God created all of us in his likeness. But see, as I hasten to a close this morning, as we look more intently on our lesson, we ought to be encouraged to know that God, he regenerates, he renews, and he restores. But as I hasten to a close this morning, the Bible says in verse 1 of our lesson, chapter 31 of Jeremiah, he says, at the same time, saith the Lord, will I be the God of all the families of Israel? And they shall be my people. Don't you know that God desires that you and I to see him as our father? That we are his, indeed his people? We know that Jeremiah was writing to Israel, but when we read the Bible, we know that God is writing to us. The Bible teaches us each week that God so loved us that he gave us his only begotten son, that we might be just like Israel, that, that we might be what? We might be a child of God. John said in his gospel to them, he gave power to become the sons of God. Verse 2 says, Thus saith the Lord, the people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness. Even Israel, when I went to cause him to restore. What I'm trying to say is that God is working in the life of the believer. And regardless of the situations that we find ourselves in, even the circumstances that are going on around us, don't you know it's affecting everybody? Whether you are great or small. That's what the Bible is teaching us this morning, and regardless of who we are. Irregardless of what we might be going through, there is one person that, that can deliver us out of all the stuff that's going on around us, and that's Jesus Christ. In verse 3, he says, The Lord had appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn to thee. Doing our hymn of praise this morning. Sister Williams said, wait, we're not finished yet. She says, I want you to put your name there. So when I heard that, and as I reflected on what God is doing in the life of the believer, if I look at verse number three, it says, the Lord had appeared of old unto Sam, saying, I have loved you, Sam, with an everlasting love, therefore, with loving kindness, I, God said, I have drawn you. If you get nothing out of this lesson this morning, 
When we see that God is talking to somebody else, put our name there that God might speak to us. I'm trying to help me this morning. It says that God had appeared to Jeremiah. But if we look back over our lives, if we look back to yesterday, if we look back to this morning, we can put our name that God, what God has, what he has shown himself unto us on this day. But as I hasten to a close this morning, he says, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor. See, God desires that you and I might get into the word that the Spirit of God might teach us. See, see, it's good to, to listen to people. But see, the problem is, is that we listen to more of people than we do of God. But uh, what I'm trying to say is, is that Jeremiah wants us to get into the word of God that we might know God for ourselves. Now, David did say, how can I know, Brother Williams? Unless some man teach me. See, 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 God is in the business of teaching, but we need to what? We need to be mindful of those who might be teaching us. But he says here, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. See, it's easy for us to tell somebody to get to know Jesus, but are we trying to get to know him ourselves? See, everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. I know, I heard this morning, if we love God, you know, uh, the things that are going on in this life, how can God allow these people to do this, that, and the other? But see, we have to look at our own lives. Even after giving our lives to Jesus Christ, we still have not dotted every eye. We have not crossed every T. We have not said everything that he's told us to say. We have not done everything he told us to do. So all of us, whether we're the least or the greatest, we're in the same boat. He says, don't teach everybody else. He says here, know the Lord. He, he says, for they shall know. He said, they shall all know me. See, 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 God will do something. God would allow some things to come into our lives that he might get our attention. I know. In my day, it was a belt. All my grandparents had to do was to put a belt around their neck. I knew, what, I knew where it was going from there. But what I'm trying to say is, he says here, for they shall all know me. See, how do we come to know Jesus Christ? Sometimes it's the situations, the circumstances that are going on around us that God might use that we might turn unto him. See, we have the word of God, but a lot of folk don't look at it. We have the word of God, some look at it, but they don't do anything that it says. But what the Bible is teaching you and I this morning is that we ought not lose hope. Because the word of God has been given to you and I, and all we have to do is allow the spirit of God to teach us what thus saith the Lord. And I love what the Bible teaches us. God, he teaches us, he shows us, and then he empowers us that we might do his will. He says, everybody is going to come to know me. See, we can know him now, voluntarily, Oh, we going to what? We going to know him later mandatorily because it says at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. You know, uh, it, 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 uh, it, cause, you know but, uh, let me slow down. He is Lord, but he given all the glory to the Father. What I'm trying to say is we can know him now by volunteering, but after, you know, after we leave here, it's going to be mandatory. See, 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 we can praise God now right where we are because God has indeed been good to us. At the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Settle me down that I might get it out. But look what he says here. He says, for they all shall know me. 
He says, from the least of them to the greatest of them. See, I stop by to say, let nobody tell you who you are than who God says. What God is saying, we put people down. We put people up. Irregardless of those we might put down, God is telling us from the least unto those who we put on a pedestal, he says from the least unto the greatest, you're going to know who I am. And see, some folk are arrogant. But don't you know that pride goes before destruction? Those who build themselves up, the only way they can go is down. But he says from the least unto the greatest. See, least in our scripture, in our lesson, it refers to someone who might be young, someone who might be small, someone whom we deem unimportant, someone whom someone might deem insignificant. How do you look at the word least? Do you put yourself above Everybody else. Don't you know salvation was given to all who might believe? Don't you know that salvation has been given to those who might humble themselves and accept Jesus Christ? See, some folk are going to end up in the lake of fire because they think that they are great. And then if they, if what I'm trying to say is that, that some folk have put their mindset to where they don't need God. But I stop by to tell us that from the least unto the greatest, they're going to know who God is. But it says greatest refers to someone who might be older, someone whom we might deem important, someone who we might deem that, have, that, that they, they are distinguished, a person of, 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 of prestige. But what I'm trying to say is that in God's economy, he looks at us all the same. Because when he sees us, when he looks at us, he's the, he sees the blood of Jesus that has covered a multitude of sins. And see, irregardless of who we think we are, we all are in the same boat. Oh, yes, we are. But see, as I hasten to a close this morning, God desires that you and I might come to know and understand is that we don't have a heaven or hell to put anybody in, and he desires that you and I, that we might live this life not thinking that we're bigger than we are of ourselves. I love what Paul said to the church at Rome, chapter 12, round verse 3. He says, God has given every man a measure of faith. Then he says that we ought to think not more highly of ourselves than we ought to. See, we can put ourselves above everybody else. But God is saying, irregardless of where we might place ourselves, those in whom we think that are insignificant, those are the ones in which God says, I'm going to do a great thing in their lives. See, all of us have reduced ourselves when we came to Christ. Because coming to Christ is saying that I can't do it on my own. I need somebody to help me. And the Bible is teaching you and I, irregardless of who we think we are, whether we're the leaders or the greatest, the believers are favored. Don't you know that God has favored us? Have you ever heard that song, He's Favored Me? See, 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 God has favored us. Because he has given us the ability to know and understand the things in which we do, we give God the glory. Even on the soccer field, we got to glorify God. Even on the battlefield, you know, I was sharing some time ago, when I joined the military, I joined the military to get away from home. I got tired of, you know, listening to the rules that was given, not knowing that when I ended up in the army that there that, that, that was more rules. There was more stuff that I needed to do. There was more stuff that I needed to understand. But see, I thought I was running away from something and ran right into something else. See, that's what it is when it comes to Christ. We're trying to run from Christ, 
Situations and circumstances enter our lives to where we have to turn around and go back to Christ. But what I love about him, he's different from us. See, see, you, we can't go to some folk, but we can go back to God. We can come back to Jesus. Don't you let favor, see, 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 favor is something done or granted out of goodwill. It could be, you know, you know we, we look at it as a kind act. But see, the favor of God is, irregardless of what we've done, irregardless of where we've gone, irregardless of what we've said or thought, God is still waiting that you and I might come to know that he is indeed a forgiving God. See, see, he says from the least unto the greatest, they're going to know who I am. What I'm trying to say is that God shows favor in the lives of those who have yielded their lives to Jesus Christ. See, the favor is a state of being approved. See, you might not approve some folk. Some folk might not approve you, but, but guess what? God approves us all. He says from the least up to the greatest. See, see, favor is being held in high regard. Don't you know that God treats us better than we treat ourselves? See, I know it sounds cliche. See, see, every now and then you hear somebody say, God has been better to me than I have been to myself. But see, if you really look at it, if you really come to the understanding of it, that is a true saying because God is, what, God is doing some things in our lives that we don't deserve. But because of his great love toward us, he said in verse number four, he says, you know, you know that, that we're going to come to know him because of the love in which he has for us. Don't you know that we have the loving favor of God in our lives? Jeremiah wants you and I to know from the least, the, from the least rather, to the greatest that we serve a God of love. God, God loves you and I irregardless of who we might be, where we think we are. The Bible is saying from the least unto the greatest, God is showing favor. <clears throat> but see, favor is showing excessive, excessive kindness. Have you ever done something for somebody? And you didn't know why you was really doing it. But see, God knows why he's doing it. He's doing it because he loves us. It says that favor is excessive. See, see, God went to, to the excessive mode when he sent Jesus Christ to die on a rugged cross. See, that was excess. See, 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 God proved his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. See, see, that's the favor of God. When the last time you showed favor toward somebody? But it says that favor is un unfair partiality. See, in other words, if God was to be unfair, the way we look at the word unfair, we would say, we deserve everything good that we get. But no, we, we deserve none of that. It's because of the love of God that we have what we have. We're not deserving. It's because of his, his mercies. I, I heard in Sunday school this morning that, you know, you know his blessings, are, his mercies are fresh each and every day. Great is his faithfulness. And that's what the Bible is teaching you and I as I hasten to a close this morning. But, but it says that favor is preferential treatment. Don't you know that God treats us better than the heathen? Even though it rains on the just as well as the unjust, there will come a time of judgment where, where folk are going to enter into the kingdom of God and then there are going to be some folk that's going to enter into the lake of fire. See, they might think they got it going on right now, but it says there's going to come a time when there's wailing and gnashing of teeth. But let's look at this favor that we have that comes from God. In verse number 31, it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. He said, even though all these things are going on around us, he says, I'm going to establish a new covenant. In other words, God was willing to wipe the slate clean. That's what he did when we gave our life to Jesus Christ. He wiped the, clay, the slate clean that, now, that we, had, we had an opportunity to start over. He says, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in 
the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Uh, he says, I'm not talking about the covenant that I made with the forefathers. He says, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. He says, everything that I did, everything that I tried to do in their life, they kept on what? They kept on breaking the covenant. They, they kept on, you know, going back on their words. See, and the Bible is teaching you and I that we serve a God this morning in spite of us wanting to turn around. You know, we can turn around and walk in the other direction, but we can always turn around and go and seek God. And the Bible is teaching you and I, as I hasten to a close in verse number 33, he says, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, he says, I will put my law in their inward parts and will write them in their hearts and will be their God, and they shall be my people. You know, God made this thing personal. He says, you know, from the least unto the greatest, he says that I'm not going to deal with them the way that I, I dealt with them through their ancestors. He, he said that I want to deal with you now according to my son. That's the new covenant. That's the favor of God. In regardless of who we think we are, whether we're the least or the greatest, not only that we see that we have God's favor, the Bible tells us that believers' sin will be forgiven. Do you know what forgive means? See, forgive means to be pardoned. It means that you know, the offender, whoever have done something, whoever have wronged us, uh, whoever we have wronged, we ought to be able to go to them. We, we uh, trust he done that. She read it this morning, you know, in our response to reading the church, we were reading. It says that if we forgive God our trespasses, he'll forgive our trespasses. And so we serve a God this morning, whether you're big or small, tall or short, the Bible is teaching you and I that we serve a God who is willing to forgive us for the wrong in which we have done. See, forgive, it means to relieve someone of a debt. Do you owe anybody anything? Uh, yeah, yeah, we, 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 we owe everything to God. See, 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 the Bible teaches you and I that that forgive, it refers to, to, to acquitting. See, see, God has acquitted us. See, the stuff in which we're holding against somebody else, God has released, and he's teaching you and I that we ought to be releasing some stuff in our lives that we might, what, that we might walk in harmony, that we might be all that God has called you and I to do. And, and what I'm trying to say is, he says here in that eighth section of verse number 34, he says that God will forgive our iniquity. Are you willing to forgive somebody else? See, that's the problem. That's the issue is that we seek God's forgiveness, but we ain't trying to forgive the one in whom has wronged us. We got to forgive folk whether they ask or not. Because if, if, if you got, if you upset with me and I've tried to make it right with you, that's your problem. It's not my issue. See, God is willing to forgive. We ought to be willing to forgive, but sometimes folk are not willing to accept your forgiveness. That's what's wrong with the church today. We got folk that have been holding stuff for 100 years, and they have not even that old. What I'm trying to say, they have yet to forgive somebody of their wrong. And God is saying, irregardless whether it's the leaders or the greatest, he says the lesser or the greater, he says irregardless of who that person is, if you come to me, you're going to have my favor, and I'm going to forgive you. That's the kind of God that we serve this morning, that he desires that you and I might come to know and understand, no matter what somebody might call you, and no matter what somebody might do unto you, you serve a God who is willing, he's able, and we shared some time ago that he's ready. He's ready to forgive. But as I go to my seat this morning, regardless, regardless of, of who we might be, whether we're on the top or whether we're on the bottom, the Bible is saying that we have the favor of God. We have God's forgiveness. But I stopped by to say this morning that God not only he has given us favor, not only that he has given us forgiveness, the Bible is teaching you and I this morning that our sins will be forgotten. See, God is not a keeping track on the things that you and I have done. He's not keeping track on the things that you and I have said. 
He is not keeping track of those who have wronged us and, and those in whom we may have wronged. The Bible is teaching you and I this morning that as we have given our life to Jesus Christ, whether we're the least or the greatest, we've given our life to Jesus Christ, we have God's favor. Not only that we have God's favor, our sins have been forgiven. And now Jeremiah says that God says that God will forget the wrong in which you and I have done. See, forget in our lesson, it refers to omitting. It refers to choosing to neglect willfully, you know, somebody, that the, the things that, that somebody have said or done to you. Forget means to cease. It, it means to fail to remember. See, see, that's the problem. See that we we go back, you know, we go back to the 60s. We we go back to the 70s. We we go back to the 80s. And some of us go back to the 30s, you know, trying to dig up some dirt that should have been covered years ago. Uh, what I'm trying to say, if God has forgotten, well, what's our problem? What's our issue? Why can't we forget it? See, see, we have the favor of God resting in our lives. We have God forgiveness over our lives and why we can't forget like God forgets. Yeah. Hey, hey, yeah. I know we like to get up and say, Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. But we, we, but we won't get up and say, Lord, I, I, I forgive so and so. I, I have forgotten. See, see, sometimes people don't think about stuff till somebody else bring it up. Yeah, yeah. And when we go to our family reunions, right? You know, we, we go in there to have a good time, and, and we done forgot about all of that foolishness we did back in the day. But somebody always got to go back and take that shovel and dig up some dirt. Yeah, yes, they do. But what I'm trying to say is, when I look at what he says here in verse number 34 as I close. Uh, forget it says it means to purposely put something in the back of your mind. See, see that's the problem, you know. If we can't let stuff go. But look what he says here as I take my seat. He says, and I will remember their sin no more. We serve a God this morning who has favored us. He has forgiven us and, and it says that the stuff that we've done, he has forgotten about it. And we ought to forget about some stuff that we might continue to walk with God. And that's what the Bible is teaching you and I this morning. Irregardless of what the situation might look like, irregardless of who the person might be, God has forgiven us. God has favored us. And we thank, that, we thank God this morning that he has forgotten about some things that you and I have done. With you through your fathers. I'm going to deal with you personally. That's why this thing is a personal walk. Don't, don't you know that favor that God has on your life? Can't nobody touch it. MC Hammer can't touch it this morning. Can't nobody touch what God is doing in the life of the believer. We have God's favor in our lives. God has forgiven us from all ills. He has forgotten. There might be someone this morning that might want to experience God's forgiveness. They might want to experience the favor of God. They might want God to forget some things in their lives. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Because Jesus Christ came not into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. In other words, when we showed up, we was in a condemning state. But by having the favor of God, by having the forgiveness of God, by God forgetting some things that you and I have done, we have the right to the tree of life that we find over in the book of Revelation. Because the Bible says we confess with our mouths, believe that in our heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He died and God raised him from the dead. It says thou shall be saved. If you saved today, that's faith. If you have been forgiven today, that's faith. If God had forgotten some things in your life, that's favor. I stop by to tell us today that we have the favor of God, the least unto the greatest. It, no, it does not matter. You know, I love what Tyler Perry said in his movie. He said, it's not what you answer to. No, it's not, no, no, no that, that's not what he said. He says, don't worry about what people say. He said, what you answer to is what costs. See, what I'm trying to say is, if we are, if we are, that we are children of God, irregardless of what somebody say, 
irregardless of what somebody do. We don't have to answer to that foolishness. We can answer to God. I know y'all gonna get on me. Y'all, y'all probably say I, I don't mess the movie up. But that's what he told that young lady. Don't worry about what they say. Worry about what you answer to. We answer to God because God has given us faith. Contact us here at newunionbc.org. We're teaching what it means to walk with God. We're teaching what it means as we com- continue to worship God. And we walk, but we can't do it without our walk. We're, we're walk witness and we're worship God together because God has favored us. He has favored us. He, he has done some things in our lives that nobody else would do. He said, I'm not going to deal with you. Well, I used to deal with other folks. Don't you know that God deals with us directly? He desires that you and I might continue to understand that we God who is able. He's able because he has forgiven us. He has forgotten some things. But at the end of the day, we have God's favor in our lives. May God bless you. May heaven continue to smile upon you.